please welcome to the stage, Brian Eng. What's up, y'all? You ready to talk about some dinosaurs and shit? All right. Yeah! Oh, okay, we got computer technical issues. So I'm gonna give you a brief, brief overview of the last 300 million years of vertebrate evolution, starting in the Permian. See, a lot of people don't real, all right, are we good to go? All right, slam dunks. All right, we're gonna jump ahead like a, we're gonna jump ahead like eh, 50 million years. Um, so uh, yeah, I, my name is Brian Ng, I'm an animator and uh, an artist, and I uh, occasionally get hired to illustrate extinct creatures. Um, this is an illustration I did of a dinosaur sp called Spinosaurus. I'm just going to run through a bunch of stuff real quick. Um, when people see my work, oh, this thing is lagging. Okay, anyway, a lot of times when people see my work, they ask, like, well, how do you know what dinosaurs looked like? To which I reply, <laughs> no, I definitely don't know what they look like. They're really goddamn weird, like extremely weird. And, um, you know, but at best, what we can do is try and make an educated guess about what these things might have looked like, how they might have behaved. So um, in order to kind of answer that question a little bit better, I'm going to talk you through the process that at least I go through when I'm trying to come up with an illustration like this where you see a fleshed out animal behaving in a specific environment. Um, but I'm not going to talk about this one. I'm going to talk about this little dinosaur. This is a newly described dinosaur called Aqualops Americanus. Yeah, brand new. Um, I was hired to do this, uh, this head reconstruction for the, uh, the scientific paper that describes the animal, and I also got hired to do um, an illustration of like the full life reconstruction of the animal in its habitat. And um, so just real quick, its name is Aqualops Americanus. That means the American eagle face. <laughs> but don't let that uh, patriot, patriotic, freedom-inspiring name frighten you Bay, 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 Bay Area communists too much. I can not even say Bay Area communist. God damn it. Just, my Americanness won't allow it. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, don't let the name fool you. The name, uh, the little dinosaur actually isn't related to an eagle at all. It's, uh, although an eagle is a kind of dinosaur, that's on a whole nother branch of the family tree that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, this little dinosaur actually didn't use its sharp beak for tearing at the flesh of terrorists. It didn't exercise Second Amendment rights or drive trucks. In fact, it predates all of that stuff. In fact, everything good and holy and American, it predates by 107 million years, which is a mind-fuckingly big amount of time. Um, it being that old actually makes it the oldest immigrant from a family of Asian immigrants. So the American Eagle face right here is actually maybe better described as like a, um, a vaguely eagle-beaked uh, Asian American dinosaur face. But, it, but Aqualops has a nice ring to it. So how do we get from, from like a fragmentary piece of fossil material to something like this, a fleshed out thing, and further, how do we get to that in a plausible environment with some plausible behavior? Um, that's a difficult question, especially when you, this is all you have of it. Unfortunately, this thing is shadowing a little. This is Aqualops' skull up here, um, and this is Dr. Andy Farkey, the paleontologist who described it, holding it next to a huge, bizarre monster. This is a dinosaur called Centrosaurus, and while they might look totally different at first glance, um, there actually is some key similarities which tell us that these things were related to each other. Um, specifically, you'll notice that both of them have this enlarged cheekbone, triangular, uh, the cheeks were kind of becoming like a horn. They also have this curved beak, um, a specialized set of teeth for chewing up plant matter, and um, in the back of their skull, you can't really see it on Aqualops because the, the skull's been crushed down into the left side of its face, which is why we need to give it an extreme dinosaur makeover. But in the back of the skull, you have these expanded bones that become this large frill. Um, so when we, play, when we look at these features, we can actually place Aqualops within the dinosaur family tree. This is an offensively, offensively simplified family tree of dinosaurs and the related archosaurs. I threw this together really quickly because it's important to orient ourselves when we're reconstructing something as to what it's related to. So just to orient you really quick, there's a laser around here somewhere. All right, everything blue is, is dinosaurs, right? 
So about 250-ish million years ago, dinos dinosaurs, common, dinosaurs ancestors split off from the common ancestor with crocodiles and alligators, which is, they're, they're lurking because they uh, hunt you with stealth behind the shadow of this vent. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the dinosaurs branched off and uh, the pterosaurs uh, branched off even before there were proper dinosaurs. So if anybody tells you their favorite dinosaur is a pterodactyl or a pteranodon, you laugh at them and you say, that's like saying your favorite bird is a crocodile. Um, so, <laughs> so at about uh, 240, give or take a million years ago, we get proper dinosaurs. And the dinosaur family tree has these two big branches in it. Over here, this branch, results, the, the, this branch has all the beautiful giant long neck dinosaurs, all the terrifying meat eaters, a bunch of stuff that's kind of like birds, but not quite, like these things had feathers and beaks, and like these ones looked like ostriches, but totally weren't ostriches. And then you get Velociraptor and fam, and then a common ancestor with them kept going, made modern birds, which just went like brah, after the dinosaur's extinction, they just filled all these ecological niches. Forget about all that. We don't need to, that, not that important right now, except to orient us. How are birds related to aqualops up here? Well, aqualops is off on this whole other side branch. And we start this side branch with some run of the mill plant eaters. You can't read that at all because I suck at making PowerPoints. This is the first one I've ever made. But anyway, we have some run of the mill bipedal plant eating dinosaurs. And um, one group branches off and becomes the armored dinosaurs, like Stegosaurus and uh, ankylosaurs over here, yeah, armor, cool, <laughs> toothproof, um, and then, <laughs> and, well, maybe toothproof, until tyrannosaurs evolved, which that's a whole nother talk about them crushing through armor. Anyway, um, another branch starts to diversify its teeth a lot more, almost to like mammalian levels of tooth diversification. Most other reptiles have like the same tooth over and over and over in their mouth, slight variations. Mammals have these like crazy teeth, and um, this, this branch of dinosaurs results in this line that comes to the duckbill dinosaurs. We have another family that I didn't draw in here called the heterodontosaurs. And then one family of these interesting uh, little bipedal dinosaurs starts doing something really wild that starts armoring up parts of its head. Um, one, one whole family that branches off of here is the dome-headed pachycephalosaurs, which are often depicted butting heads, although that's debated. Um, and then another branch of the family results in all these little bipedal horny things. Um, Aquilops was one of those little bipedal horny things. And, and one, of the, one of the common ancestors here goes on in North America to result in this incredibly, insanely diverse family of big quadrupedal horned dinosaurs with uh, frills and horns and all this kind of shit. So Aquilops is interesting because it's the first representative of this group that we see in North America. Um, and then there's all these other weird monsters in the crocodile tree that are completely neg neglected in this. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of things. Um, so uh, fortunately, once we place something in a phylogenetic tree, we can look at what it's closely related to. Now, it's important to bear in mind that in order to become a fossil, you have to die in a really exceptional place. You have to die like in a lake and settle into clay, or you have to get buried. Fortunately, some of Aqualops's close relatives lived in an environment that was really conducive to exceptional fossilization. Aqualops itself, we only have this crushed little skull. There might be other ones out there waiting to be found. Um, but this is uh, Aurorociratops and Archaeoceratops. And these are Asian relatives of Aqualops. They lived in a place where there was a lot of sand dunes. And apparently these sand dunes would collapse from time to time, or there'd be a sandstorm. And animals would get buried intact. And the, the way that the sand would form into sandstone, it wouldn't totally crush their bones and skull like Aqualops's was. So we have these amazingly preserved full bodies of Archaeoceratops here and Aurorociratops. And they tell us some interesting things. First of all, these animals' skulls were more different than each, than each, how do I say this? This guy's skull is more different than this guy's skull than this guy's body is from this guy's body. They had like the same body, but they were adapting their heads much more so than, uh, than the rest of them. So that tells us that if Aquilops is on the family tree kind of between these two guys, while it has a distinctive skull, it probably had about the same body. So that's really useful information for me trying to reconstruct these guys. Um, other interesting thing is that uh, some of the close relatives preserve these growth phases where we found a number of specimens. Um, some of them, in, like in Protoceratops, which is a little more advanced than uh, Aqualops, we have from baby all the way to adult. 
And one of its really close relatives, this is Liaoceratops, a little more primitive than Aqualops, but very closely related. Here we have a juvenile on this side, an adult. And one of the things that we consistently see in these horned dinosaurs as they grow is that their um, frill and horns expand. These cheek horns get bigger, the frill gets bigger. The teeth show more development, and they get a worn edge on them from chewing lots of plant matter, presumably. And uh, the eyes in the juveniles are larger in comparison to the rest of their head. Again, useful stuff when trying to reconstruct the rest of this animal. So I took a bunch of pictures of Aqualops. Um, I, I got to move fast here because I've been, I get, I get really excited. All right. So <laughs> this is Aqualops compared to Archaeoceratops. It's much smaller, but we know it's not a baby because it has a mixture of adult features and juvenile features. So the Dr. Andy Farkey concluded that it's probably like a sub-adult. Like it's not quite finished growing, but it's getting there. Um, I took a lot of pictures with reference to Archaeoceratops to come up with a uh, complete skull reconstruction. This is the smashed other side of Aqualops's face. What you're actually seeing here is the top of the skull folded down in. So we have pretty much one whole side and the top and most of a lower jaw. Um, and that allows me to come up with a skull reconstruction. This is my skull reconstruction up here. This is the one published in the paper by paleontologist Matt Waddle. This is the one made by the Oklahoma Museum of Natural History. These are all a little bit different because at every step of the process, there's a little bit of, a little bit of art mixed with the science. Um, and I show this just to demonstrate that we don't know exactly what it looked like, but this is our best guesses. Um, I came up with mine by basically uh, cutting the, the crushed skull apart in Photoshop along the, the crack lines and trying to adjust for that crushed uh, profile to try and get a better idea of what it looked like from the side, which then allows me to reconstruct the head and the body. And now we move on to trying to put some flesh on the bones. Um, a lot of people will say uh, that alligator and crocodile taste like chicken. What they don't realize they're saying is that alligator and crocodile are actually distantly related and share a ancient archosaur ancestor with dinosaurs. Um, they have a lot of the same, they have a lot of the same muscle groups as, uh, as birds do. They have a similar kind of muscle. They have a really fine grain, high density muscle. And um, what you see in birds and in crocodiles is a lot of the same muscles, just different ones are more developed for different, uh, you know, life habits. In the case of birds, we have huge breast muscles for flapping the wings. In the case of crocodilians, we have huge tail muscles, huge neck muscles, and huge jaw muscles. Um, not so much good at flapping wings, but really good at lurking through a swamp, biting you, crushing your body, and tearing you apart to eat you. Um, <laughs> So with reference to these modern groups, here's a quick and dirty uh, muscular reconstruction of what Aqualops might have looked like with uh, his or her skin ripped off. Um, which brings us to skin. How do we know what the skin looked like? Well, fortunately, because we know what Aqualops is related to, we can look at what is also in the fossil record. Here's the skin of Triceratops and Chasmosaurus. These are, um, again, giant, monstrous, uh, huge horned dinosaurs from the end of the age of the dinosaurs. Um, so, but what's interesting about them is they have this, these big tubercle scales surrounded by these small circular granular scales. And it's consistent in these two taxa. And that implies to us that, okay, maybe that's something that's common to this family. But you can never be too sure until some, you know, you can never be too sure about your reconstruction because always new stuff is being found and occasionally people find stuff in one of those exceptional places to die where your body gets preserved in rock in awesome detail. This is uh, Cetacosaurus. It's, uh, it's even more primitive than Aqualops. It's one of those little horny bipedal things that was running around. Um, and you can't quite see the detail in these photos on this screen, but you're going to have to take my word for it. It has basically the same scale texture as the big guys did at the end of the age of the dinosaurs. Um, it preserves some interesting details, like a, a sheath of horn covering that cheekbone horn. Here you can see the cheekbone. It's kind of rounded. Here you can see the horn. It appears to be longer and more pointed. There's a, there's a sheath of fingernail-like material that covers that. Um, it also has these derpy little toe pads, which <laughs> indicate to us that maybe these animals were using their shorter front legs when they, maybe, when they dropped down to feed on the ground or something like this. And then the coolest detail of all, and the most surprising to a lot of people, was this. Check that out. It's got some kind of hair-like structures on its tail. Um, 
And this is really exciting because we have a mixture of like different scales and we also have uh, something reminiscent of what you might find in birds or maybe even mammals. Um, this is really surprising, but it's also uh, been seen in a number of groups of dinosaurs. Remember that blue dinosaur family tree? They've now found representatives of every major branch with some kind of either hair-like structures like this or fuzzy structures or primitive feathers, and some even with like advanced feathers like you see as you get closer to birds. Um, so now we want, we've got to t discuss the horn. And I did a dumb thing. I forgot to mention an important feature of Aqualops. It's got this little nubbin of horn on the tip of its nose, or little nubbin of bone, I should say. Um, you can see it here. It's not a pathology. It's not a piece of stuff missing. It's, it's a bona fide, weird little knob on the beak. And um, so when reconstructing these animals, we look at things like horns and beaks, and we try and figure out, OK, what would that look like when soft tissue was covering it? Bear in mind, your fingernails will rot when you die. The horns of things like this pronghorn antelope usually rot when they die, as do hornbills' horns and the horns covering chameleons. Inside, there's this bone core. And when you remove that sheath of horn, you see a very different shape. So this is more than likely what would fossilize. And so when we look at Aqualops's little nub of a beak, we go, aha, maybe this is the beginning of these animals starting to evolve horns or spines or weird knobs and things on their face. Which begs the question, why, why the hell are they growing shit out of their face? That's just weird. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling good. No, no horns anywhere, right? Um, this is an interesting thing because when we look at the living animals, we can, we can learn a couple things. First of all, we can learn that, the, like I said, the horn sheath increases the size of the, the horn that you would actually see in the fossil. The other thing is uh, these animals consistently in all of these groups, in ungulates, chameleons, um, a num few other different groups of lizards and in these hornbill birds, uh, these structures are primarily for species recognition and sexual display and territorial combat or sexual combat. So like these Jackson's chameleons, this is a male. The female doesn't have these horns and he'll battle other males to defend his turf. Uh, the hornbills, um, both genders have the weird things on their head, but they use them for um, uh, you know, rec basically showing how healthy they are. In the hornbills, it's really weird though because they're hollow, some of them, and they actually use them to make sound like a tuba. Um, so. What we, so we, we look at these animals and we go, okay, if, if Aqualops is at the beginning of this evolutionary arms race to grow weird shit out of their face, what other things can we look at for, for clues about what it might have looked like when it had skin and stuff on it? So here we have uh, some chameleons. And one of the things we see in, in all of these groups is that they use color and soft tissue generally before they start evolving elaborate horn structures. Um, you see this in mammals, even though mammals, these mammals you know, don't have great color vision, but they're used, still using striking coloration so that they can be recognized by their species from a long distance away. They're also doing some interesting things like growing manes. Well, you know, we as mammal-centric humans just go like, oh, a horse has a mane. But really, like, a mane is, is a completely useless feature. It's great if you want to have like a Mongolian on your back, you know, riding without a without a halter. But like for these animals, what that really may be is a sign of sexual fitness. Like you can grow this beautiful head of hair, and then you attract members of the opposite sex and make more dinosaurs, mammals, or other monsters. So based on this color information, I try and come up with some reasonable uh, uh, coloration schemes based on. Uh, these are based on living uh, reptiles and birds. And I tr we try and come up with something that'll work given the environment and the niche that this animal lives in. But what is the environment this animal lives in? Again, we look to the fossil record. Here we have these really fascinating uh, fossils from the, same, um, from the same strata as Aqualops. And they show basically a redwood tree um, with needles like a giant sequoia. It has cones pretty much identical to a coast redwood but it has the reduced needles of a giant sequoia. Coast redwoods will have these like fan-like needles because they grow where it's moist. And we see these reduced needle size, which indicates to us this might have been an environment with, uh, with uh, you know, not as much moisture as you might find on the coast of Northern California. Um, the, the ferns and the, uh, the primitive mugwort-like angiosperms that were growing at the time also show reduced leaf size. And some of them are so similar to modern forms that we can now start to go, OK, what does this environment look like? Um, these modern forms grow uh, in a variety of different open woodland without a canopy. The sun is getting through to the forest floor. You have a relatively high water table. There was a lake near where Aqualops was found. 
And um, you have these giant, this is a giant sequoia in the Sierras. And so this gives us a sense of the environment. There was this uh, seasonal dryness, enough water to sustain big trees and ferns, um, and a seasonal wet dry fire cycle. So that kind of influences our coloration of the animal. But we really can't see the whole picture until we find out what was living alongside Aqualops, this cute little dinosaur. So let's meet the neighbors. Um, so here's Aqualops down here, little. Despite what some Christian scientists would like me to tell you, this guy has not been found in the same strata as these other animals. Um, this, is, uh, this is Homo sapiens, us. Um, anyway, all these other animals are found in the same stratigraphic layer as Aqualops. And we have a meat eater here. This is a, a, a relative velociraptor called Deinonychus, about the weight of a wolf with the appetite of a hawk. And um, covered in feathers with deadly claws on its hand. We have this huge near tyrannosaur sized meat eater named Acrocanthosaurus, which bear in mind, something T-Rex size might not want to eat something the size of a chicken, but this, lay, this whole belly cavity right here is for filling up with eggs. So these things, just like modern birds and reptiles, would lay clutches of eggs. And then these, you know, these hungry, young nightmares would be running around the habitat <laughs> searching for things to eat. So Aqualops was on the menu there too. And then all the herbivores in the environment are way bigger than Aqualops. There might have been other ones that we haven't found yet because small things tend not to preserve as well. But point is, this thing, one of the largest land animals ever, its neck would go like way up there. This is Sora Poseidon. You gotta watch where you, where you are at if you're Aqualops because you might get stomped. Now, we have one other interesting meat eater in the environment down here, cut off a little bit. This is Gobi conodon, and it's a mammal. Um, so this is the skeleton of Gobi conodon. It's remarkably simmer, similar to a modern opossum skeleton, except it's more robust. It, was, it had heavier built bones and deeper muscle attachment points. So it was like a beefed up opossum with crazy fucking teeth. The first incisors are like Nosferatu fangs. And then the top incisors are all like, it's like four canines like hanging out together. And then the back teeth, you can't see terribly well here, but they, they're, they're these uh, bladed, multi-cusped, um, premolars and molars, they look kind of like a shark tooth if a shark tooth had like five points on it. Uh, we don't know exactly why they had such incredibly gnarly looking dentition, but it seems pretty certain that they were eating meat. Um, so I look to modern predatory uh, marsupials um, for reference when reconstructing. This is my reconstruction. And then we included a baby aqualops trying to get away. Again, this is... Um, Again, this baby is a little bit speculative because we've never found the, the actual baby of Aqualops. But remember, we have those growth sequences from other ceratopsian dinosaurs. So we have the reduced, the reduced cheek horns, the reduced frill, the big head and eyes comparison to the body. Um, and so then that made me wonder, uh, where would you hide in this environment? A big important part of my process is going out in the wild and like, you know, stomping around, looking at trees and stuff, and trying to figure out, okay, if I was an animal living with baby Acrocanthosauruses around, where the fuck would I hide around here? And, and, and why do I have flip-flops on this log, right? So this is, um, this is what I found. This is, my, this is my ideal habitat that I would want to hide in if I was the size of a chicken living in this habitat. This is a fortress of roots from a fallen redwood. You can actually see there's a small mammal burrow there in real life. And so I thought it would be really cool to use this as a burrow structure for aqualops. These are my flip-flops for scale, <laughs> roughly the size of an aqualops body, conveniently enough. You know what they say about guys with aqualops-sized flip-flops? <laughs> All right, so anyway, um, that was shameless. Uh, so anyway, so then this is my pencil render. So I, I incorporated this stump. We have a, a burrow here with an adult aqualops emerging from it. And again, this is a speculative baby aqualopsis, speculative adult aqualopsis based on those growth phases we see from related animals. This is our adult aqualops with quills like we saw in its relative Cetacosaurus. And we've got this little nightmare Gobi Conodon cruising in here and a whole bunch of ferns that took a really long time to draw. Oh, and baby, baby uh, sequoias. So that's how we arrive at the final illustration. Um, but I have one more image I'd like to show you. Bart, if you could help me load up this video. Um, I, I don't blame anybody who hears this talk or sees this shit and goes like, so what's the point? Like, these things are really dead. Like, really, really dead. They don't affect my life even remotely. Um, but I'd like to show you this one more thing. Um, 
at the university, or sorry, yeah, at the, at the Utah Museum of Natural History, they have this awesome wall set up. And this is the bottom of the wall. We're looking at the floor here. This wall is about 40 feet high. Excuse me. And it's, um, it's arranged as a family tree uh, with a whole bunch of the crazy ceratopsians from the end of the edge of the dinosaur at the top. Um, hit space bar. All right. It doesn't have aqualapse and its relatives on it, so I added them with the power of computers. And then as we go up the family tree, we see this splitting and more splitting. And by the time we get to the top, we start to see some really huge, bizarre monsters and a crazy diversity of them. And bear in mind, each one of these splits, that's a family. That's not just like this species. That's, that represents a huge amount of evolution, only a little bit of which is recorded in the fossil record. Because remember, you have to die somewhere exceptional to get fossilized. So, Way up here at the top, there's Triceratops. There's the one you've heard of. And these, this isn't even all of the ones that have been found. Um, and the reason I show you this, again, these animals are really dead. I don't care. Like, what, who cares, right? But what's amazing about this is it, I think it shows what an incredibly um, huge, vast tree of life there is. And again, this is just a few of the ones that this museum has not even all the ones that have been amazingly found by a person eroding from a mountain, prepared, got to a museum. The person didn't sell them into the black market and make lots of delicious money. Um, so this, this, I think, is kind of cool. Even if you don't care about dinosaurs, I think it's worth having at least a vague idea of what the tree of life has in it. Because, you know, I, I feel like when I see something like this that, I need to appreciate the time that I have, this infinitesimally tiny moment in this incredibly vast history of life. So thank you all very much for listening. You've been a great crowd. Um, I hope I didn't go too long. Oh, three questions? All right. Dinosaur question right there. I'm going to predator laser you. Oh, Aqualops. So Aqualops is. OK, it's a good question. So Aqualops, all that we have of it is that one crushed little skull. But because it has close relatives who are exceptionally preserved, we can reconstruct it with a reasonable degree of confidence based on those close relatives. It would be like if you found the skull of a coyote, um, and it's kind of smashed, and then you find like dog, wolf, uh, fox, and you have the whole skeletons and multiple, multiple ones of that. You can go, okay, this thing's probably shaped like a dog or a fox and the rest of its body. Um, but it is a good question because there are a lot of highly speculative uh, portrayals of ancient creatures because a lot isn't known, and it's necessary with any of this stuff to infer some things from living animals and extinct stuff in, elsewhere in the fossil record. So who, the, the, the short answer is like, I don't know, like it's kind of try and do a good job and lots of research. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, whoa. I may, uh, she said, you have my dream job. How did you get it? Well, okay, first of all, before you decide that it's your dream job, bear in mind that this is like a, a small slice of what keeps me afloat financially. I do a lot of freelance animation work um, and illustration stuff. Most of those jobs totally suck. I did some animation for a really bad short independent film that was like, I'm, I'm sure it's going to end up on Netflix, just buried somewhere. Um, but in this case, I befriended a paleontologist online. I was just trying to get better at drawing dinosaurs, and I was running some weird ideas I had by him. And he was like, oh, yeah, those, t those ideas totally make sense, and nobody's illustrated that. You should illustrate it. He liked what I illustrated. And then uh, I sent him a, I made a rap video with crocodiles eating gazelles. And he really liked that. Um, <laughs> that's not online anymore. but. Uh, I probably broke a few copyright laws, but anyway, um, yeah. Uh, basically, like just like being like be the dork you are at the right people. I think is the short answer. Um, last question. Oh shit! Uh, yeah, I, my website is don'tmesswithdinosaurs.com. Um, I have Prince of Aqualops available. I was gonna bring some tonight, but I totally ran out. So that's a good thing. 
Um, but yeah, my website is don'tmesswithdinosaurs.com. I have the, the, the final art of Aqualops and its whole family and everything. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to be adding more prints. So stay tuned to my website. There's also articles explaining, like blog posts explaining my process and linking to the scientific papers that I've been involved in and stuff like that. Um, so I guess that's, that's it. Ready to launch?